most of you are in a club. And I think that's uh, really important. As uh, I will explain to you here in a second. All right, so I think you can all see my screen right now, right? So I, I just want to start out by congratulations on showing up to a group meeting. Again, if someone could help monitor the lobby because I can't see it when I'm presenting, I, I would appreciate that. Uh, and I would say group meetings are really good for me. I've, I've gotten a lot of benefit from that. Um, so it looks like people are waiting in the lobby. Is there someone who can admit with that? I don't know who's how many there are. Um, but I do want to say people are our biggest resource, and I thought I'd share a little story about how people are our biggest resource. And it, it starts with um, me in here. Well, I've always kind of been in clubs growing up all my life. And when I inherited my beehives back in 2011, I knew pretty early on that I needed more help. And my daughter was already in the Central Iowa Beekeepers Association, and I know there's several members here um, on the meeting with us. And, you know, I would drive Alex to meetings and, our, you know, our mentor was there. So in addition to that group, which at that time, it was a quarterly meeting. Um, it's now every other month. Um, but at the time it was quarterly and it wasn't quite enough for me. I knew that Des Moines Backyard Beekeepers was a club, but they hadn't been active for many years. So with the help of some of the Des Moines people in Central Iowa Beekeepers Association, we started to activate Des Moines Backyard Beekeepers. And now um, most of you probably know about our Facebook group that's gotten a lot of members um, in recent years. And so that was a big help to me. And then after I spent a year with bees, by the early part of the season in 2012, I was really sure that it would be very helpful to, um, to let community gardens know that, hey, bees would be a great way for you to increase your yield. They helped me increase my strawberry yield immensely. So I wanted to help everyone else get those benefits. So I got plugged into the local food system network at the end of the season and through my work with the local food systems, um, I got plugged into the Women Food and Agriculture Network and I ended up contracting with WFAN for a little bit and at our first convention, the first convention I attended in 2014, there was a vote run lead workshop and if you look at the the logo down here, if you can see my cursor with the plate, there was a plate to politics workshop that really got incorporated into my life. It helped me learn how to make a positive change in the world. And from there, I attended another WFAN conference where I learned about specialty crop block grants. And the brand new executive director at the time had just left the Michael Fields Institute and Michael Fields is specializing in grant writing, grant advising. And when I joined those two things together, I ended up getting blaws.org in 2015. And then after that, I went to another WFAN conference where this woman spoke, and this is Lisa Kiverst in Wisconsin. I've, I've known her for years, and she made this offhand comment at a grant workshop, something like, you know, Farmer rancher grants are due next weekend, and this is one of the only awards that an individual farmer can get. And I always remembered that. And in the process of trying to talk for other people last November into applying for a farmer rancher grant, I just got this idea that kind of fell into place. And I got letters of support and bids and everything kind of worked out. In the span of about 12 days, I submitted my application, and now we have this. The name of my project is a monthly planner that combines phenology and beekeeping to improve honey production and native foraging habitat. And um, I, I recently talked to Lisa, and uh, it was 
it was pretty fun to let her know, hey, you know, four years ago you made this comment because we always have our meeting like three weeks before applications are due um, and you always talked about it. I actually did the thing and uh, it was pretty nice. So anyway, Farmer Rancher Grant is part of North Central SARE and North Central SARE is just the region where Iowa is located and it's a program of the USDA. It's a competitive grant program and again it's one of the only awards that is given to an individual. SARE also has programs um, for educational institutes, um, professional development, um, research as graduate student grants. So again it's it's one of the only places you can go as an individual not associated with a nonprofit organization. In order to get a grant you need to address SARE's three pillars of sustainability and for us that would be profit over the long term, stewardship of our nation's land, air and water, and quality of life for farmers, ranchers and their communities. And if you go back and you look in the history of, of any of the regions that SARE has, you'll see that there's a huge wide diverse range of ways that people have created to meet these goals of sustainability. And it, it's pretty cool. I think we're all pretty creative people and we like to solve problems. And one of the goals that I would like to solve um, after teaching um, beekeeping since like 2013-ish, um, one of my goals is to fill that knowledge gap by combining beekeeping tasks with a calendar and field guide um, in phenological order. So a monthly planner, that, that's what that looks like. But again, it's kind of hard to imagine. So let's, let's just kind of take a look at what it might be. So first we're going to start off with a little phenology. So have you heard of any of these adages? They're kind of these farmer's almanac things. Um, one that I always heard that I always I never understood how to know this was you plant corn and beans when the oak leaves are the size of a mouse's ear. Like I never understood. <laughs> like, OK, what kind of mouse and can I even if it's a mature oak tree, can I even see that? Um, and it sounds like people are in the lobby. I'm hoping they're getting admitted. So anyway, if, if you've heard any of these kind of adages, that's kind of what I'm looking for um, with this with this planner. So it kind of looks like this. Um, we all know what beekeeping is. We, we know what we need to do. We're just not completely sure when to do it. Um, and we understand the calendar. Um, again, we just organize our lives around calendars. And then phenology, um, this is a picture of a maple tree down here and the events of the tree um, that occur. We maybe haven't called them phenology, but I'm sure everyone recognizes the maple seeds here. You maybe don't recognize the maple flowers or the leaves or maybe the bark. Um, and so this is kind of where I want to combine all of these things, kind of with that farmer's almanac adage knowledge that gets passed down. I'd like to have that turn into this planner. So it would be a field guide on the left and it could be plants that we're looking for. It could be um, animals like I've got a frog on here. Um, there could be birds if we're looking for bird calls. Um, these are the different things that we're trying to identify that will help us know when to do our different beekeeping tasks. And then on the other side we've got our our dates for whatever month that happens to be and then you can make your notes for um, you know in in B yard one I saw uh, maple blossoms and in B yard five I saw um, pussy willows blooming so and you can say on this date 2021 so it kind of goes like that and we'll have beekeeping activities for that month that hopefully are cued by these different phenological events um, included on both the left and the right hand sides of this planner. So this is bees and plants. Um, don't really have a name for the planner. I can describe what I want the planner to contain. Again, hopefully we'll have a name for it soon. Maybe one of you will come up with a really good idea for me. I'm not sure. 
Um, the objective of the project um, is to increase floral awareness of everyone who's using the book and the effects of these flowers. So this will be measured by a survey and it'll ask you things like how many native plants could you identify before you got this planner and after you use this planner. That's that field guide portion on the left. And then if you could evaluate the planner by saying, you know, I was able to prevent swarming, I was able to notice gaps in the forage um, that's available here, or I was able to increase my production because I was more aware of the habitat. And maybe you're able to add more native habitat or your landowner can, can add more. Um, those are the things that we're hoping to accomplish with this planner. And I will share this result with clubs um, once everyone wraps up after a year of using the planner. So I wanted to give you an example of how this might work. So um, we know that honeybees come from Europe. Well, white Dutch clover also comes from Europe. And clover is very susceptible to high temperatures. It's also really susceptible to drought. And when we look, I, I've seen a couple studies, and I'm thinking of one in particular by Dr. O'Neill up at Iowa State, where he found that it's, it's you can find a lot of white Dutch clover, um, about 50% inside a beehive um, in the middle of summer. Now, it, like I said, it makes sense to me. Um, clovers and bees both came from Europe. They probably evolved together. That's maybe why they're preferring clover. But when we're having crazy weather, I think it makes sense to look at a food source that blooms at roughly the same time as white Dutch clover that will have just as much value. And so why I'm saying we've got a problem with white Dutch clover because of how it responds to drought and high temperature, which I don't know how Iowa would ever get rid of drought and high temperature. I think that's always going to happen um, at some place in the state. At roughly the same time of the year that we'll have Dutch clover, we also have butterfly milkweed, which is extremely drought tolerant and heat resistant. So that's just one example, all right? So how does this work? Well, hopefully all of you across the state would be able to help me by telling me what you're seeing in your part of the state, or if you're in Omaha, you're, you know, any county that's touching Iowa, I think is, is good. So I'm looking for things, you know, it could be lore that your mentor passes down to you. Like ours says something about lightning bug flashes to us once. I'm not sure what kind of activity that cued. I need to call him and ask, but I know that was something that he was, he was definitely very set on. Um, frog calls, that's another thing that we look for, um, like winter solstice, you know, the, the longer days. Um, that's another cue that we use. Um, dandelions, very frequent. Um, if it's something that's hard to explain, you can always give me a call and explain whatever that that cue out in nature is that you use to do your beekeeping activity. Um, if you have pollen and nectar sources that are important to you, whether they're native or not, I still want to hear about that. So what would be really helpful would be to get a photograph of that first bud burst. And the idea behind this is that um, we, I believe that things open up, let me think, south, east to northwest, but it could be southwest to northeast. I, I'm not sure, but I, I feel like the way the, the first frost kind of moves is, is kind of how the bud bursts move. And if I could get a picture that's got the time and date stamp and geolocation of whatever it is that's, you know, the first bud burst of a pussy willow, if I could get a picture of that sent to me at this email address, um, that would be extremely helpful to, to get our understanding of the way um, the phenology happens. The, the phenology will always be in the, the same order. It's going to be on a different date every year, but it will always occur in the same order. And for people who give me the earliest 
um, swarm call or the earliest, like I said, pussy will, or the earliest, whatever it is. Um, the proposed budget included a, a $10 reward for that early, whatever the occurrence is, uh, up to 12 of those. So um, photos, they've got to be digital, um, just so I can verify, you know, whatever name you're calling that thing is what we think it is. Um, so I can determine how many of you found, say, a clover, the first clover, the first dandelion, um, how the opening rate moves across the state. I would really be interested in that. And again, if I can get whatever name you're calling it, um, I'd like to group all those together in the data collection and then yeah, I'll analyze it later. Um, need to know the nearest town or location if you don't have geolocation. Um, you can send me a Facebook message, but I, I find it's easier um, for my record keeping um, if you use email. If you suspect or witness honeybee activity with a plant, I'd love to know about that. I know like with elm trees or I mean, there's just a lot of tall trees that I can't really see all the way up there if a bee's visiting trees, but I know this is a great time when they visit trees because there's really nothing else open right now. You know, I get that. Just let me know. And like I said earlier, native and non-native species are accepted. There does not have to be a honeybee on the picture. That's all right. Um, anytime between now and October 1st is when I will accept photographs or emails or calls or whatever it is. Um, first frost happens around that time, so I'm, I'm cutting you all off after October 1st, and then I'm gonna get to work um, looking through all that data, putting the book together, um, having Chris print the book um, over, he's in the Les Hills, um, and then everyone who participates, if you sent me an email, you get a copy of the planner, you get your name in the planner. I will definitely get your name up to any presentations that I give in the next year. And the hope is to have the planner be free. Um, we don't know how many we're printing, but we're assuming that it's free or it's very low cost and they will be distributed in time for everyone to use in 2022. And hopefully this all works out timing wise. It works on paper. It works in my head. I don't know if it works in reality, but um, so far it seems like it's a good plan. And I did just get uh, an FAQ up on my website. So if you wanted to go to juliecash.com and go over to the sidebar, um, you can take a look there at the FAQs if you've forgotten anything I said, but I am recording this. And I'm gonna, I think, quit recording here.